And now, please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker, Mr. Kojo Namdi. Good morning. And congratulations to the class of 2016. Please give yourselves a warm round of applause. Because we're all here today because you, because of you, and because you have succeeded in completing a plan, a plan that's going to be a key ingredient in your personal future. It's you, after sleepless nights, after nervous days, after long hours spent writing papers, after hours of reading, oh, so much reading, after wondering, after worrying, after doubt, after uncertainty, it's over, it's done. <laughs> You have succeeded. You have won. And it's sweet, isn't it? Have you been celebrating? Partying, maybe? Up all night? Maybe a little hungover? But that's OK. <laughs> you go, girl. A key building block to your future is now in place. You can now look ahead to what's ahead. And what's awaits you is what you make of it. That's right, what you make of it. Each of you and each member of your family, each of your friends is justifiably proud of what you have accomplished today. The certificate you earn will help you in the job market, it will help you in the career of your choice. It can help you to win friends and influence people. It can help to provide financial stability. It might help your social life. It might even help you find a partner for life, if you haven't already. Well, you can decide for yourself what you would like your individual accomplishments in life to be. A hero of mine, long deceased by the name of Franz Fanon, he said, quoting here, it's the role of each generation out of relative obscurity to discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. It's the role of each generation out of relative obscurity to discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. I learned that when I was about, oh, maybe 23 years old, and it used to bother the heck out of me. I'm a baby boomer with such a large generation. How does one young person figure out what the mission of his or her whole generation is? I couldn't figure it out because sometimes the hardest thing to see is what's right in front of you. Sometimes it takes a while. You figure you're in your corner of the world, your chosen place, or the place you just happen to be, and that's all you can see. At the age of 23, I was just about to embark on a college career. See, like some of you, I had to work for years before I could go to college. And I lived in a country in South America called Guyana. There you go. <laughs> At least one Guyanese here. And when I was growing up, there was no television in Guyana. The internet wasn't even a concept. Today, all of that is your reality. So it should be easier for you to see what's right in front of you. What's right in front of you, what you see every day, is a world in which the rich seem to be getting richer, 
The middle class is struggling to maintain. I've got a friend who's about to publish a book. The name of the book coming out, I think, in August will be 55 Unemployed and Faking Normal. She's talking about a lot of people that you and I know. Even if we're not aware of how difficult a time they're having, because, well, they're 55, unemployed, and faking normal. You may want to get that book when it comes out, because you don't want to find yourself in that position. We're in, in an economy that's not very kind to people who are getting older. I'm not talking about uneducated people. I'm talking about people with advanced degrees, people who have gotten used to living well only to find themselves middle-aged and out of work. They're right in front of you. You see them every day. They've still got the pride, they've still got the demeanor and a lot of the clothes from their previous life, so it's not easy to tell that they've fallen on hard times. But that's where an institution like this one, Montgomery College, comes flying in like a superhero to the rescue. Here's a letter from a student who graduated last year. My name is Harriet. I have a PhD in pharmacology. I'm one of the students who graduated from the clinical trial management program in December 2015. I'm also one of the beneficiaries of a college transitional scholarship. Although I am highly educated, I faced some hardships, along with six fellow scholarship students, and I needed a helping hand to overcome. Although it is premature to say that we will get internships or employment right away, I know for sure that we are far better than we were three months ago. I'm writing this letter to let you know how much I appreciated the help I received in order to gain the CTMP experience. Most importantly, I would like to thank you for making this program and others like it available to the residents of the East County community. That's what Montgomery College can do for you. But back to what's right in front of you. In addition to the middle class struggling, there's indigence, there's poverty. You may find this hard to believe, but when I first came to Washington back in 1969, there were no panhandlers anywhere, none in sight. Today, you've got military veterans, people who have served their country, standing on street corners, asking for help. Whole families with at least one parent working, still unable to afford a decent place to live. And this is right in front of you. But what's also in front of you is your future, the one you are building right now, regardless of your age or what stage of life you're at right now. Many of you here today are young, some not so young. Some of you are parents. Some of you are military veterans. You come in all beautiful colors from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of life experiences, but you all share one goal, the goal of self-improvement through education. So the people right in front of you, the people you used to see only with your eyes, I'm calling on you now to see with your more enlightened minds. And when you look out at the world that's in front of you, when you look out at the global village, 
You can see people in Syria dying in a civil war. You can see people in Somalia dying at the hands of a terrorist group. You can see the effects of poverty in South America, in Southeast Asia, or in Southeast Washington. And you can see regimes under siege in Iraq or in Afghanistan. You can see the devastating effects of climate change in the Philippines, in India, in Cambodia, in Honduras. But unlike my generation, those things won't seem so far away. For one thing, just look around you. The people you meet on this campus, any of these campuses, can tell you about those things. A lot of them have lived those things because there are students here, as was pointed out, from over 100 countries. All you have to do is ask them. In addition, one of the places you live now, one of the places we'll all be living in the future, is in front of a small screen on a mobile device. And that device, that computer in your pocket that's also a camera and a phone, it can bring you images of what's going on just about anywhere in the world at any time. A violent crime in your neighborhood, one click, one tap, it's right there. An island disappearing in the South Pacific, there, you can actually watch it. Riots in Venezuela, right there in front of you. A drone strike in Yemen. Minutes later, there's a video of that destruction on your cell phone. But what can you do about that stuff? A whole lot, it turns out, because you have that information literally at your fingertips. One tap, one click can tell you there's a farmer growing vegetables he can't sell in Maryland. Another click can inform you there's a farmer looking at the devastation of his crops in Papua New Guinea. There should be a third click that can tell you how to connect those two people and how they might be able to help a mother who can't feed her hungry children in southern Sudan. See, what all of those people now have in common is you. You who are informed enough, you who are educated enough, you who are enlightened enough, not only to know about their situation, but you are the ones who now have the tools at your disposal, the technology and the brain power to figure out how to address those kinds of problems and how to solve them. Because you're going to be solving those kinds of problems anyway, right here in Maryland. You've gotten the kind of education that teaches you how to improve your life right where you are. Many of you still go to work every day, even as you take advantage of the access to higher education and training that Montgomery College provides. But what I'm asking you today is to keep your eyes on the prize, as we used to say in the civil rights movement. That's why you wanted to get an education. That's why you went out and did this. You didn't get this education so you can focus your attention on the gender of people using restrooms. Though I understand that's important to some people, but that's not why you pursued this education. So don't be distracted. What education teaches us is to understand and accept the people of the world in all their beautiful diversity. Education provides us, thank you. Education provides us with the collective will to bring change. It's no coincidence that it was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that had students leaving the North to register voters in the South in the early 1960s. Their enlightenment as students is what fueled their collective will. That's what smart people like you 
bring to the table, collective will. And it's the will to do better, a will to be better. Take the 1963 march on Washington when hundreds of thousands of people of all races converged on Washington. They didn't show up to hear the I have a dream speech. They had no idea that speech was going to be delivered that day. That's not why they showed up. The march was called the March for Jobs and Justice. That's why they showed up. They showed up to express the collective will of a people to demand jobs and justice. And we have to thank them for the sacrifices they made, for demanding jobs and justice at a time when a lot of people thought that their main concern was who could use what restroom, one for blacks, another for whites. No, that's not what they wanted. What they wanted, what they demanded, was justice. A justice that still too many Americans, black, Latino, gay, lesbian, transgender, women, still find evasive. But justice enough that a nation that once upheld and tolerated slavery could summon the dignity and grace to elect an African-American man Barack Hussein Obama as its president. Justice enough that Darian Pollard today can stand up and lead as the president of Montgomery College. She's standing, she's leading, she's a shining example of what the way forward in America can look like. How justice can manifest itself in the diversity on which our future must be built. So thank you, President Dr. Pollard. The world is changing today at a faster pace than ever. We can only hope that in this rapidly changing world, we're not retreating in the march toward justice. Because that can happen. And when you listen to some of the remarks being thrown around in our current presidential race and in our current political environment, let that serve to instruct the young and remind the old that the road to justice was never smooth never easy. It's a rocky road with pitfalls, traps, pushbacks, reversals along the way. But that future is for you to decide. And you've made your choice. Getting an education is what will lead us forward into the future. Your collective will is what will determine the way forward. You're living in a globalized world. Your life every day exists at an intersection where America meets the world, where the same social media you use to connect with your friends and relatives every day, that same social media is what's used to spark movements in America and revolutions abroad. Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, it's a world where the fix on your laptop is done by an individual in a land far away who's looking at your screen and manipulating it from a small kiosk in a large warehouse that may be surrounded by poverty and slugs where there's no running water. That's just today's reality. When you're connected to the rest of the world in ways that my generation could only imagine. So what are you going to do? I'll tell you what I did. but. That would take up too much of your valuable time. Suffice it to say that I found my way to Washington after stops in Montreal, Canada, and New York City. And I now work in radio. And I work in radio in a city, Washington, D.C., that's often described as the most powerful city in the world, but a city whose citizens 
have less influence on how our country is governed than you do. Each and every one of you, if you happen to be a resident of Maryland, if you happen not to live in the District of Columbia, each of you has more to say about how the laws of this nation are made than all of the 700,000 residents of the District of Columbia. Because you're living in a state that sends voting senators and representatives to Congress. The 700,000 residents of Washington, D.C. pay federal taxes, serve in the military, die in conflicts abroad, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, have a larger population than at least two states, and yet we do not have a voting representative in Congress. Neither House nor Senate. We have one non-voting delegate in the House of Representatives, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who makes her voice heard loudly and clearly. But when the Speaker of the House calls for a vote on the floor of the House, when the roll is called, it does not include the District of Columbia. Of course, that quaint notion of District of Columbia being a federal city is really a mask for the partisan politics that now so beset us as a nation. It's a mask intended to cover a crude political calculation that if we, the residents of the district, were a state, if we had our rights of citizenship, voting rights in Congress, then it would be to the advantage of one political party over another. As you can see, I could go on about this lack of fundamental democracy to over half a million other citizens. Okay, so I will. Just yesterday, a congressional committee proposed legislation to block DC from using its own taxpayer dollars without the consent of Congress, even though voters in DC approved the measure to do that by over 80% in 2013. So I'm saying all of this because, frankly, I'd like you to be outraged because it's happening right down the street. And it's why I proudly wear the DC flag tattooed on my forearm. But today is not a day for outrage. Today is a day for celebration. Today is a day to give thanks. You have just earned your certificates. You have passed a crucial test in this ongoing odyssey we call life. So enjoy it, because tomorrow, you've got to go out and get back to work. <laughs> Along the way, you'll find that you'll often be called on to do battle in the arena of ideas. Well, as someone who has been moderating on-air battles in the arena of ideas for over four decades, I think I've learned at least one small, often overlooked thing that I'd like to share with you before I go. My main rule of thumb the person who talks the most is not winning the argument. It may surprise you to know that it's often the best listener who wins in the battle of ideas. <laughs> Listening is actually a skill. When I was growing up, as I mentioned, there was no television, so people listened to the radio intently. That's where I learned how to listen. They may call me a talk show host, but most of what I actually do is listen. When you listen well, when you listen carefully, you're able to distinguish the difference between substance and style, the difference between serious ideas and bluster and you're better prepared to make your own arguments effectively. 
So if there's one thing I'd like you to remember as you leave here today, it's the power of listening. Anybody can talk. Talk is cheap. I'm doing this for free. <laughs> but think about how you got to where you're sitting today. Just how much listening you had to do in your life in order to learn. You know you didn't talk your way into this degree, this certificate. And after you leave here with it, you may sometimes be tempted to think you know more than anyone else, that your listening days are over because, well, you've got ideas. Nothing wrong with ideas, and you should have them, and you should be passionate about them. But ideas ultimately are about people. And if your ideas are going to affect people, other people, people besides yourself, it's important to listen to those people in order to understand their points of view. In the final analysis, it's the opportunity to put your ideas into practice that will make a difference. The struggle over ideas is ultimately a struggle over how to improve the lives of people. And that's the mission for which this Montgomery College education has prepared you, even as you improve your own life. I'll go back to where I started. It's the role of each generation out of relative obscurity to discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. You're multi-generational here. So I say to all of the generations graduating here today, you are now mission ready. Thanks to Montgomery College. Now, go out and fulfill your mission. And congratulations to you again.